Hi everyone, I'm here with my friend Belle Skinner. She is an incredible singer and songwriter, truly one of the best I know. And I'm so excited to have her here to talk with us today. Uh, I wanted to first start off with just talking a little bit about your background musically and when did you start playing music? How old were you? When did you start songwriting? All those sort of, your upbringing with music. Um, well, I've always sung as a child. I took some piano lessons when I was a kid um, up until like 6 to 12 and I never practiced and I never basically count that as like wasted time. Um, yeah. And then I picked up my brother randomly, uh, gave me the guitar when I was 15 and I sporadically played it, but I really started to get into guitar learning covers and things uh, my freshman year of college. Okay. With piano, I didn't know the concept of a chord or what exactly I was doing. I just, you know, looked up a song that I liked and figured out how to play it. So. Mm -hmm. You just were reading the chord names sort of yeah, and going yeah, off yeah, of it yeah. like that. Yeah. And then when did you start actually writing music? Pretty soon after, like into the freshman year when I started to really get into so it. was college. Kind of, yeah, it was like a, a coping mechanism from all the like anxiety. <laughs> <From> the <school. laughs> so. Were you a music major in college or? No. Okay. No. Yeah. What did you major in? I majored in uh, theater and Russian studies. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I studied theater in Russia. So that was the combination. Oh, of those. that's where it all came together. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then when you graduated, did you really start pursuing music after, right after graduation? Well, it was my last year of college, actually, that I really started to focus in on music. I came back from my study abroad in Russia, and I realized that I didn't want to pursue theater. And I auditioned for a classical guitar private lessons at my school because that was the only guitar that they offered and I didn't really know much about guitar. And it turned out that the teacher, we did about a semester of classical guitar and then he realized that I was writing songs and he was really interested in folk music too. So he let me use his studio and he really encouraged me in that and through that I got a fellowship to study music production in London for a year and that was where I really got like the, like the validation that I should continue doing mm. songwriting. So before we get too deep into the video, would you mind just playing us a little snippet of a song you've written just to give people a little taste? Sure. Um, okay, well this is a song that I wrote called Magic. It's for the Halloween record that I made. I was inspired by the lockdown times when everyone was uh, kind of terrified to go to the supermarket <laughs> and stuff um, and you couldn't see anybody's face and I was thinking to myself how is anybody supposed to fall in love at first sight yeah <laughs> so uh, I ended up writing this song <laughs> Sitting there across the room You saw me and I saw you And all the world went quiet Like it was praying You cast a spell and soon I fell So helpless and so tragic But suddenly I do songwriting process like like what do you when you sit down to write music do you usually start with the, like a melody line or I feel like your music is very melodically beautiful so um it depends on the song so sometimes it will be a phrase like that's the easiest the easiest type of song where it has the the hook and stuff you're like I got the hook we're good <laughs> yeah some songs I remember one song I wrote like I was writing it on a napkin while I was eating my Cheerios and like the whole song was written in my head. But other ones, I would say, yeah, melody usually comes first. There are some songs where there's one song that I'm currently uh, on the process of recording that I wrote a poem first. Like hmm. sometimes if I'm stuck, I'll write like a poem and like based on that, I won't, I won't take the structure of the words 
but I'll take like bits of it or the idea behind it and then put it into the melody that I'm working with. Yeah. Um, so, but it's really hard for me at least to write words and then make a good enough melody. It's possible. But That's hard for yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very hard when the words come first, I think. Yeah. It is possible, but yeah. it's harder. Yeah. I think it kind of, for some, sometimes like you can tell when the words were written first. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah. Ideally, I think they're kind of written simultaneously. Yeah. But in a perfect world. <laughs> in a perfect world, because I definitely have a few melodies that I've just never put lyrics to, and I, I'm like, I like the melodies a lot, and I just have never found the right lyrics for them, and they just, I've never done anything with them because they just, I never can put the lyrics to them. It's frustrating. So it can be frustrating on that end too. I know. Um, have you started? Well, how do you write? Do you write on paper or with a computer? Mm, both. Both. Yeah. Yeah, I found that. I've always used to write on paper and now I'm migrating over to the computer because yeah it's like using a different part of your brain and also there's a lot less like um, like feeling that you're running out of space or wasting paper <laughs> and you yeah. can always like copy and paste like draft one and put on the bottom and yeah then, like, I like when I write lyrics on the computer I can just keep the old version and so then because sometimes you edit the lyrics and you're like you know I like that older version yeah. more so I like on the computer I just can easily just go back and look at like my lyric documents are like always pages long on the computer because yes. I'm just like redoing it I'll just copy and paste it and redo it process notes is what I call yeah. the file <laughs> yeah. yeah you know we were talking earlier about I'm getting and getting stuck with writing words sometimes like right now I just wrote a, a French song on the computer using like Google Translate and Thesaurus sign, <laughs> all that stuff. Well, and uh, maybe you're getting stuck because you're writing in a language you don't speak. That might be part no, of it. No, it's actually <laughs> unlocking something because it's like I think I would get stuck if I was writing a song in French too. Believe me. <laughs> I think what it is is if you write if you write songs if you're starting out like everything is open like there's so many possibilities. But at least for me, I don't know. Maybe you'll disagree, but. The longer you do it, you start to like edit yourself more because you're like, oh, I already wrote a song about that. Use that, that adjective. I, yeah, right? or like use that theme. And so if you're writing in a, a different language or on a different instrument or something that's slightly different mm. than, I don't know, something in me kind of unplugged where I was like, oh, I'm so limited in this language that I studied in high school and that I really, I know like a very small vocabulary. And I'm just going with it, and I just want to say the simple thing. The best songs are the ones that say a lot with very little versus, uh, like, songs that say very little using a lot of words. <laughs> yeah, like, for sure. Yeah, so I'd rather go that route. Like, yeah, it's okay yeah. To be it simple. forces you to be, like, sort of precise and simple with your lyrics. Yeah. I like, that's interesting. That's an, I've never thought about trying to write something in a different language for that reason. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. I like that. I think everybody has at least one Google Translate foreign language song in them. Yeah. I think you should go for it. So on my channel, we talk a lot about music theory and um, I'm curious about how you use it with your songwriting. And when you're sitting down to write music, do you think of it in any kind of theoretical way or do you sort of just try to feel it or well now I think I do use it more I think yeah kind of related to what I said before if you write songs long enough you use up whatever innate thing that was in you already and you you do need to kind of expand um that's I think that that's kind of just a responsibility that you have as an as any kind of artist no matter what you do Mm -hmm. um, Not to just keep making the same kind of stuff over and over again. Yeah, and you'll naturally feel and that. you're going to want to expand, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. So when I was initially writing, I think it's really important, like, not only uh, is having, you know, an innate ear or whatever, I think it's important uh, what kind of music you were raised on or what you listen, what you input, whether you're raised on it or whether it's later in your life. Like, I always really liked melodic music, so... I can write things in my head. I've written some songs just using my head and not really knowing what's going on. And they're usually, like like I said, simple songs. They work for a reason. So you they're can really write. not simple, though. Yeah, well, maybe deceptively simple. <laughs> they're not simple in, like, a bad... I feel like simple yeah. is... make is Because your songs are quite complex and sophisticated. And I think when I first met you many years ago, you didn't know as much about music theory. And then over the years you've gotten good with it. Mm -hmm. But I was actually really impressed when I first met you because I noticed that you 
didn't really know too much, but yet you were writing these really sophisticated songs with like intricate harmonies going on and you had all these different arrangements of musical instruments like written out and it was like really like it was something that if anybody saw it they would be like oh this girl really knows music theory in and out and you really didn't and I was kind of shocked I was like wow that's like really impressive because it's I mean it just shows that you're very naturally musical um which is good so (laughs) maybe well correct me if I'm I'm wrong in in thinking this but maybe when I say simple I'm thinking of like something that you someone else can sing back even if they might not like know catchy what's going. yeah maybe catchy. yeah and melodic I think one thing I love about music is it's very melodic yeah sometimes people write music that's kind of overly complex and yeah. just not very melodic and at the end of the day a good song really needs to have a nice strong melody I think that's like one like, of the most important things once you're done listening to the song can you Hum so back the yeah, melody. Yeah, hum it back. Yeah. Yeah. Is it pleasing to listen to? <laughs> is the melody pleasing? This is important. Well, I've, I have, yeah, I've listened to, you know, pleasing music in the moment, like recordings, and then afterwards I'll be like, I, I don't remember yeah. what I just listened to. So. I think also there are people who, who study music a lot, and they get really, they're actually quite advanced, they can improvise really well, they know, they have a very deep understanding of music theory, they've really analyzed and studied it a lot, but they maybe don't have the best natural musical instincts and sometimes that music that they write is overly complex and just not it's missing that melodic mm-hmm. center that it needs to have yeah i would much rather listen to something that has a beautiful melody and isn't but yeah i think it's i think it's just cuz those people were not i don't think because they like studied theory intensely they suddenly lost the ability to write a good melody i think it's that they probably from the beginning were never like never had it in them truly to write beautiful melodies that's my what I think but I wonder yeah like does learning a lot of theory mess you up like as a songwriter that's my question well I'm thinking of pianists right they to play piano would you agree like you kind of do have to know theory to play piano because it is like a lot of black and white notes you kind of have to yeah I mean right and yeah and I mean if you're like a classical pianist you at least have to be very good at reading music but yeah usually really accomplished pianists know a little bit about music theory you Mm kind of have to yeah but you'd be surprised a lot of like I know pianists who are like great accompanists and like or they are classical pianists who they really don't know much about like chord theory and they can't like they couldn't like improvise over chord progressions that well and that kind of stuff so it's classical it used to be that classical pianists could improvise really well figured bass and stuff like yeah that that was like back in the day (laughs) yeah yeah you're a songwriter who and I'm, I'm the same as you actually when I first started writing music I really didn't know anything about music theory. I was just writing stuff that sounded good to me. And Mm -hmm. then as I was writing, I was like, I wish that I could understand a little better what's happening. I'm hearing a chord in my head, but I'm having a hard time putting it on paper. I wish if I knew more about music theory, I think I would be able to, if I would speed up my songwriting process rather than me just sitting there hitting random chords until I find the one that is the one in my head. Sometimes do you ever like go like hum out the note by note? Yeah, thing? sometimes. Yeah. Or I'll hum out like one note in the chord that I am oh, like I, I want. S- I still do that sometimes. Yeah, 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 and I do too. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong, wrong with that. It's slower, and if you the b- better trained your ear is, and the more you know about theory, then it just makes that process of like brain to yeah. paper quicker. Definitely. But then, does it become a crutch? Like, does it remove some of the mystery and the beauty of yeah. Listening to music and songwriting, do you think it does? Yeah, sometimes, like, if I hear a song and I can, you know, in the past couple of years, I've been able to, you know, recognize the qualities of chords and the numbers of chords and stuff. So mm-hmm. I'll be like, I'll hear a song and be like, oh, that is just a minor four or something. And yeah, it does take out the mystery or like, you know, part of the jump start of writing a song sometimes is to have like, oh, that's a tasty chord and like a combination, a, a pairing of chords or something. That'll be the jumping off point. Mm-hmm. And um, it does kind of take all that away a little bit, but I I think not to the extent that it, it does completely. It definitely makes me search a little bit deeper, I think. I definitely don't regret <laughs> learning, learning more. Learning more. What because, are the benefits in your opinion? Like, um, Well... Aside from the songwriting part, it's the fact that um, 
I now no longer have to rely just on muscle memory to remember all the ex- ever expanding repertoire that I have. I don't know. On stage, like if I'm in a moment where I'm like, I don't remember, is this the F or the G chord in the key of C? I'll like, I can hear in my head, oh, it's supposed to be a four, not a five. So I can, mm-hmm. in the moment, play it. And I don't have to rely on like practicing it to death. Right. Um, so stuff like that is tremendously important. Um, and even having a melody line that I think sounds boring with certain basic chords, like the four, five, one. Maybe I'll add like a different chord that has a interesting flavor that has contains a note that is in the melody, but is not the chord that you expect. If that yeah, well, that sense. would make it a yeah, more interesting yeah. chord choice. Then. Yeah, and I think I did that subconsciously in many of my songs before yeah. I learned theory, but now I'm expanding more on that, and I'm using more diminished chords and augmented chords, and I just think it totally like expands the vocabulary and makes a possibilities more accessible. And at the same time, I just wrote a song that has very basic chords in it, and like that's fine (laughs) so Mm -hmm. I don't think it it totally blocks it out and also you can communicate with people um for sure like playing with with, other musicians yeah yeah because I used to play with jazz jazz musicians and they'd be like oh that's the two five one and I'd be like I don't know what that means (laughs) yeah and I can easily make chord sheets like quickly I don't know and I can easily transpose songs like on the fly Mm -hmm. like when I play guitar now I used to think in terms of like the actual shape that I'm making like uh, in capo four but I'm playing a G chord right that's how I used to think about yeah. it but now I'm thinking as I'm playing I'm like this is the one this is yeah. the thing and I think thinking in terms of relationships rather than like the names is like way more in those number relationships yeah versus the chord names yeah, yeah well it just it trains your ear to like hear them as relationships between the chords yeah and better. it also feels less it feels, I, I haven't, I've never really like articulated this before, but it feels like more integrated. Like it feels like you're not disconnected between what you're hearing and what you're feeling and what your hands are doing. Like it hmm. feels like, interesting. Like everything is kind of united better. Yeah. In a way. Yeah. So, no, that, that makes sense. I yeah. like that. I think what you said about the memorization thing is huge. I think that's one of the main benefits. It of, was becoming a burden. Yeah. Because if you're, I remember when I, before I really knew much about music theory, I would like be on stage and I'd be playing and it was always a terrifying fear that I would just forget what the next chord is because I had just memorized the series of chords and the series of hand shapes. But I had no, there was no concept of like why this chord was coming after the other. And if you forget, you're screwed. Like you can't really, you can't really like wiggle your way out of it. It was just scary because it was like if you mess up, whereas if you forget the chord, as you said, now, now once now that you sort of know more, if you do forget the chord in the moment, well, you can kind of you can hear what the chord is supposed to sound like, and you're like, oh, that's the four chord, and then you go to the four chord. So you can you can find your place more easily. You can you can fudge through mistakes more easily. It's just it's much less stressful for for, for performing and for just memorizing music in general. Yeah. Also, being in a jam circle, uh, like, and. Like, I've been recently in, in gr- like, very frequently in groups of, like, songwriters, song circles, and I can mm. just quickly, like, figure out what the home chord is and then immediately start, like, playing along. And I was never able to do that. And especially... You're like, yeah, it's so fun. It's so fun. I'm not... I don't... I'm not at the level where I can, like, solo on the fly, but it's such a huge thing, especially because... Um, sorry to put, like gender into it but girls aren't really expected to play along in jam circles or whatever so I feel like it's really empowering and also like other girls in the group see me do it and that's and I'm like encouraging them to do it too because like it is great and you know it's not that that hard to do and um yeah and and in terms of the repertoire thing like I have a a google uh spreadsheet where it just has the name of the song, the capo, the key that it's in, and the starting shape. And my just because I know, memorize the song, that's all the information that I need to like, wow. go that's amazing. and start playing that song. So I want to know, how did you get better at learning music theory? Like, what was your process to get... How did you start tagging those chord numbers in your head, and what, what was the process to get... Because I'm sure people watching are like, well, I want to be able to do that too. Um, how do I get to that place? Well, 
I think it's the first thing uh, you need to learn is just like the basics of scales and key signatures and things mm -hmm. like that, circle of fists, like be aware of those concepts and the awareness of the number system and how that like what does a one four five mean just like basic diatonic yeah. chords and so, your major scales yeah. yeah so i knew that already and but what really kind of locked it in and i didn't realize that this was i mean this is what jazz musicians do they're like just like steeped in it for years and years they go to university and like it's what they it, breathe right yeah. and uh so instead of doing that uh during covid um, like right when lockdown happened, I had this uh, book that my friend lent me um, called 90 Days to Sightseeing Success. Mm. And it was lying around for years. And uh, I was like, well, I have 90 days. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's for Maybe high I'll school. Just like, stuff. Yeah, I always wanted to learn how to sightseeing. I was, I didn't know how. I was terrible at singing in choirs and I was just like dependent on everybody around me. So I was like, well, at least I'll do this. And um, just by doing like three lines a day and the soul what, fedge? yeah the soul fedge and getting used to the key signatures and having that in my hands and that like really just the repetition every day which is what like actual <laughs> real musicians do um and like embodying it uh really just like locked it in me up to the point where I was able to you know I hadn't touched a piano in years and I was so comfortable in like instantly seeing a note and having the meaning of it and like where it's placed in the key signature like up to that point um, that I just sat down and was able to play both hands piano wow. reading bass and treble clef so that was an unexpected side effect and then in, in addition like I was hungry to keep practicing it so you know um, I got more sight singing books and there's another th uh, 90 days of sight singing success and another, there's like a series of three so I just did that for hmm. nine months um, and just like doing it every day a little bit and then what I started to do was this was what really got me into the numbers thing it was seeing a melody line and then playing the chords that you would naturally like hear and so it's like a major line then I would play like a one or a four or five chord but then I would try and um, like play around with what other kinds of chords would fit using mm -hmm. that melody. So let's say there's a do. So and the first the first note of the melody would be like do. So normally you would play a one chord do mi so. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I would think, what other chord can you do? You can do a minor chord because mm -hmm. a minor six has a la do mi or. Do, uh, four chord can have a do and then so on and so forth so like yeah just hearing what it would sound like so hear what a flat seven would sound like hmm. over the melody or a minor five or a minor four or whatever so yeah. like you can play a major melody but use all minor chords and it would have a totally different flavor mm -hmm. um so that really it was just like a fun thing that i did but it really did help and it didn't really and did you do that every day like with your yeah, sightseeing just like with my Part regular practice. practice yeah so you did it all in about nine months yeah i mean wow. it's just, yeah That's covid <laughs> yeah COVID just a, the, the thing that that book really taught me was because i'm very much like a i'm really intense about something and i go full force and then I drop it and don't do it and that's just not how music works mm -hmm. so the fact that the book was like and you can use any book really you don't have to use that book like there are plenty of sight singing books as long as you have exercises that you commit to doing every day like 15 minutes if you have longer half an hour is great but like 15 minimum and just do it and just having like that that schedule was really helpful in it like made me realize oh you do need to do it every day which is so obvious yeah but uh yeah that really really helped i don't do it anymore <laughs> um so i wonder how my my actual sight singing is but i still like you retained the i retained it yeah the knowledge that so, you learned that's so cool yeah now i want to talk a little bit about your recorded music because you mm -hmm. have a, you have a bunch of music on spotify and please like please 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 go listen to her music because it is so good really it's like incredible how many original music albums do you have you've got a couple um, the most recent one is violets right well no you have that halloween album yeah that came out a little after that yes yeah, so. that is some original music mm -hmm. but then before that you put out violets which i'll definitely link to violets because it's an, an incredible album and it's filled like every song on it's just like beautiful and, and awesome um 
And then your most recent album is a Joni Mitchell tribute album, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the process of recording all these? Like, was it? Um, well, each one is different. So the Joni was kind of a little bit spontaneous because I wanted to do a video series on YouTube where I just like, and uh, it started off. Well, I won't really get too many in the details, but it started off with a cover that Joni Mitchell did, House of the Rising Sun, mm -hmm. uh, from her archives, and I really liked it. And then I was like, well, why don't I just do a whole whole thing? Um, and I recorded it nicely on a nice mic at the same time that I filmed it, so I was able to you know, get it mastered and everything and, yeah. and put out into an album. And I ran it through a tape machine, too. Um, oh, cool. So, you did that with Violets too. You also ran it through a tape machine, right? Yeah, that was that was not that was more than just like me on guitar live. Yeah, that was like other instruments were added, but yeah, yeah, adding running things through a tape machine, <laughs> like really glues the sound together really nicely. Do you do it after you've recorded everything? Yeah, everything. Yeah, there was actually one of the songs, Mon Cherie, uh, the French one. The, I think it was at the end of the tape roll, so there was like a little bit of a wobble on one of the channels, so like I think it was the guitar, and it added like this really cool retro wobble thing that was like perfect for the song. Yeah, so. your recorded music does have a very nice kind of warm sound to it, and I guess maybe it is that tape. Yeah, I think, it, I think everyone would sound good with it. Yeah. Because what it is, is like when it's digital music, you're just hearing... You don't really think of it consciously, but it's very subconscious. You're just hearing like bits, right? Mm -hmm. And like different reverb patches, like like it's not all in the same room. Like nowadays, people don't do it in all in the same room. So, like having that tape, like really. I know there are like fake tape machines you can run it through. Right? Like yeah. it takes the sound and it runs it through a tape machine. Where? I wonder about that too. Is it? I wonder if it's good or not. I mean, they say it's very. It's probably pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, we're going to get into the whole, like, <laughs> the difference Analog between versus <laughs> yeah, AI versus human. Yeah. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think there might be something ineffable about the... Actual running it through the yeah, machine. Yeah, kind of like with photography, too. It's like the photograph isn't, like, little bits. It's like the actual mm -hmm. light rays or whatever. Thing yeah, yeah. Like. Yeah, so, I don't Interesting. know. Interesting. Now, you also do a fair amount of performing live. What is the... What is that like? Do you like performing live or do you, yeah? Yeah, I really do. Is that an important part of the music process for you? Because for me, it's not so much. I, <laughs> that's like my, my least favorite part of, I like recording music. I like writing music. I, I do like performing, but it's not my, I don't love it the way a lot of musicians do. I think I sound the best live, to be honest. Like hmm. even, even being recorded on a, uh, on video or on my yeah for like a sort of live thing I feel like it's not the same thing as like I guess it is like the tape like <laughs> the analog thing um I do I do get a lot of feedback of there's something extra in the live thing mm -hmm. I I can't hear it myself because I'm obviously myself but um yeah maybe it's the combination of the seeing, the hearing, and also like the space that that makes it. You like you need to see me to appreciate the sound. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You need I, the full package. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and so you know my process in recording, I'm like on this never-ending quest to like capture the live that sound. feeling. Mm. Yeah, maybe it isn't live, but like as close to that as possible. I That's why I, I am gravitating more towards the old-fashioned style of recording because, you know, back in the day, it was like, you just It was come much in. more live. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I have been thinking about this recently. Um, back in the day, there wasn't a legacy of recorded music. Let's say when Frank Sinatra recorded his, you know, now iconic records, he didn't think these records are iconic like there was nothing really to refer to but now when artists go and record there is a little bit of an added pressure to like this is gonna like we know it's gonna be out there forever like Frank Sinatra didn't have a concept of forever at that time does, does that make sense what I'm saying yeah like, I think so there's so, more pressure in maybe the recorded sound now that yeah uh, and so I think the casualness like I was listening to a Pete Seeger song the other day and he's just like, you can tell 
it sounds really nice. It sounds all old and like very cozy. Like he's playing on his instrument and like his voice cracks <laughs> in yeah. the middle of the song. And you don't even notice. Like I listen very intently. Most people wouldn't notice, but I'm like, that was the take. And that is now the classic recording that we all live with and that's fine yeah um and there is whereas something... nowadays you obviously would have redone it if there was a voice crack yeah and there is something special about like not being so precious about it mm-hmm. um that i really want to get back to but it's so hard because i'm such a perfectionist yeah so no that's yeah. when you're able to like keep re- redoing things and, and it's like it's so hard not to because mm-hmm. you want it to sound as perfect as possible yeah it's hard I'm a fan of the multiple takes, <laughs> and yeah. I think most people are. Do you ever get stage fright when you're performing live? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you do? Yeah. Um, it depends. I didn't used to get stage fright when I was a kid. I was such a ham when I was a kid. Really? Yeah. I was like... I can see that. You're still a ham, so... In a good way. I mean, um, that's always a good thing. Yeah. And then, I think in high school, I think it started when I started taking singing lessons in high school and then I suddenly became too hyper aware like if you think overthink too much about things anyway and I had an audition for something uh, after that and I like majorly bombed it and um, that was the first time I experienced stage fright and it, I was 14 and I think that like triggered something mm. so ever since then you're like oh oh shit you can mess up you can mess up and it can be horrible it, was, it, can, it can actually go really badly it was really really bad like my voice can, like thing and I started again and then it did the exact same thing and I was like I am living in my worst nightmare yeah. ever you're like oh this really can be a total disaster <laughs> yeah. I see. And, it, and I have had disasters since then but in a way I'm sort of grateful for the stage fright because um, there are ways to combat it my second voice teacher ever like I told him that I had it and instead of focusing on technique he he focused more on repertoire and like diving into the meaning behind songs and I sang a lot of foreign language songs so I would like translate it word for word so I would know what I'm singing in the moment and like picking a spot and like creating this story in your head and like feeling it that way really helped and then also just performing a lot more helps with stage fright. If I don't perform for a long time, then it does feel like, wow. Like, yeah. It's so weird. When you're doing it frequently, it's a lot less scary. Yeah, it's like, whatever. Um, but I, like I said, I'm grateful for the stage fright because I think when I, in, in cases when I'm not nervous, there can be a sort of deadness to your performance. Like it kind of helps you keep be excited a little bit. Hmm. I think a lot of performers do have they call it stage fright. They're like, oh, my handshake or something. But it's just like a natural adrenaline thing. And it really, it is actually good for the performance. It's only mm-hmm. when it becomes uh, debilitating and like really messes you up, then it can be a thing. But that's that's basically like focus on what you're saying and also just do it a lot more. I really started performing more. I got into my first ever con- competition and I was like oh my gosh I have stage fright and I have to be judged so I was like I need to perform as much as possible so I did a ton of open mics Mm -hmm. and like and then when I finally got to the contest like it all paid off so yeah uh, practice didn't you do spend a year doing like an open mic every week or something yeah what was that (laughs) so when I go to a new city uh my my mo is to yeah go to a lot of open mics because it gets you familiar with people there. I just did it to meet a lot of people and like play everywhere. And but didn't you do like every single open <laughs> mic in New York City? Oh, yeah, there was I something did. you did yeah, like yeah, where yeah. it's like you're like yeah I spent one year doing one, one open mic every week and I did every single open mic across New York City. Yeah, I think I did in the f- first like ten months. I did like a hundred and fifty open mics or something like that. Holy smokes! Um, That's okay. a lot of sitting through other people. <laughs> I think... Playing at mixed levels, I'll say that. <laughs> I think it was a combination. I started out doing only open mics, and then it's sort of like I got booked gigs because of that. And like, yeah. So it was a mix, not just open mics. But yeah, there is a point where you're like, no more. <laughs> yeah. So, but well, after 150 of them, yeah, you might be like, I'm good. I think yeah. I did it. <laughs> I did meet some some very good friends through that. So I'm, yeah, yeah it's great. Um. And I plan, you know, the next city that I move to, I will definitely do that. Uh, and song, songwriter rounds too, but yeah. You just so. go in and blow everyone away at the open mic. They're like, who is this girl? 
Who God. is she? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we recorded a one of her songs called Tapestry, which I will link in the description below. It's a beautiful song. I'm just singing uh, harmony on it, but definitely go watch that video. And I will also include all of your links to your YouTube channel, your social media, your Spotify, all that stuff. Really, definitely go listen to her music. It's it's She's one of the best songwriters and singers I know, so it's really... Uh, I don't say that lately. Um, it's really, truly beautiful music. So uh, go check it out. Um, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, can I quickly say what the song is about? Yeah, to... oh, Tapestry. Yeah, Let's yeah, talk. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Um, so just for some context, uh, there's a poem by uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson called The Lady of Shalott. So The Lady of Shalott is cursed to live in a tower and... She has to weave a tapestry and she can't look out the window. Uh, she can only look out the window through a, mirror, a reflection in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And then one day she sees Lord Tennyson, uh, sorry, <laughs> and one she, day she sees uh, Sir Lancelot uh, riding by and she looks out the window and the mirror cracks and then she realizes that uh, the curse has come upon her and she's going to die. So she leaves uh, the tower and she gets on a boat and floats down the river to Camelot and by the time she reaches the town she's dead so um, I took that poem and the same basic like setup but uh, in the song she hears the night um, but she decides not to look out the window mm. um, and that in itself is a different kind of curse so that's interesting what the song is oh about. I love yeah. that yeah well thank you so much uh, yeah. You guys, thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. Check out Bell Skinner's music. Um, and thank you again. Yeah, thank Give you. Give the video a thumbs up. Yeah.